All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. I am Pete Carmichael, the director of the Civil War Institute here at Gettysburg College, also a member of the history department with my co-host, Ashley Lusky, who is the assistant director at the Civil War Institute. And we are very pleased to have Dr. Edward Ayers with us uh, today. Uh, give a little Hello, background. Waving. Yes, I'm going to give a little background, a very brief bio. Uh, it is hard okay. to summarize. Ed's uh, career in an efficient way because he has done so much. But I will get the high points, I think. First, born in East Tennessee, uh, not so far from Knoxville, where he spent his undergraduate days at UT, volunteers. And then from there, off to graduate school at Yale, where he completed his PhD, and then spent almost the entirety, almost the entirety of his academic career at the University of Virginia. Uh, to leave there for a brief stint, I believe nine years as the president of the University of Richmond, where he is, I didn't know there was such a title, Ed. You're the emeritus pre uh, 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 president of the University of Richmond. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Does that mean you get to carry the scepter around still? No, it just means that I, I get parking. You get good parking. Not even, <laughs> not even, not even courtside seats for the basketball game. Oh gosh, no, not if we beat Kentucky last week, especially. How about that? Yeah, that makes a season. That absolutely makes a season. I was joyful about that as a native Hoosier. Whenever the Kentuckians go down, it's a cause for us to uh, to rejoice. Well, uh, Ed had a prolific career. He's published a wide range of things. Um, one of my favorite books that he has done is The Promise of the New South. It is the book, uh, when it came out, there was all kinds of noise about it, that it was a refutation of C. Van Woodward's classic, uh, Origins of the New South. It's not that at all. It's not even remotely close to being that. It is a cultural and social history, which I think makes a nice accompaniment to uh, Professor Woodward's book. It's a fantastic book. Um, he's done digital projects as well. He's an active uh, public historian and for all of that, he received in 2013 uh, from Barack Obama, the National Humanities Award. That's quite an honor. Now, Ed, you gotta be honest with us. Are there days when you put that medal on and strut around your house from time to time? You know, it's under glass. So I'm waiting for some day that I'm desperate enough to do that, but I'm not, I'm not about ruling it out. You're not there. Yeah, it's I, I, I still wear my 4-H medals that I got. <laughs> in high school. I still trade those around the house time to time when my ego needs a little bit of a boost. So today we're here to talk to Ed about his brand new book, Southern Journey, The Migrations of the American South. There it is. And with the and audacious dates of 1790 to 2020. It is quite ambitious, is it not? <laughs> this is based upon... Professor Ayers lectures at LSU. It's the Walter Fleming lectures. Uh, many of you know that is a very distinguished lecture series in Southern history. A number of books I suspect my our audience has read from time to time are based on the Fleming lectures, including this, James McPherson's, I've got terrible glare here. James McPherson's, What They Fought For, that's his Fleming lectures that he gave. It's a fantastic book. And most of the Fleming lectures, in fact, are published in a book that's pint sized like this. Ed Ayer. This is everything about Ed's power and influence in the field. How did you get a coffee table book here, man? This is quite impressive. Now, LSU was great about that. You know, I just said, well, first of all, when I gave the lectures, I showed these maps and I, I, I cleared it with LSU before. But I'd have to say, so I think there's maybe 100 maps in that book, and as you see, that it's beautifully produced. It's incredible, really. Um, and But it was possible because we made the maps ourselves at the University of Richmond uh, with my two colleagues, Justin Madron and Nathaniel Ayers, who figured out this method I'm gonna describe here in a minute. And so LSU, it was possible because LSU didn't have to pay for generating all those things. And uh, so, but boy, they were great sports about it. And I, I love the binding on the side of the Southern Journey sideways and all that. So I'm very grateful, but you're right. I'm generally a pain. Uh, you yeah. know, people invite me to the lectures and so then I presume upon it and say, hey, what do you say we make a coffee table book? And uh, they, were, they were down with it. Well, I just want to say from the onset that this book, um, as it is already suggested, it is an ambitious book chronologically and spatially. 
It is a book, as it, it always does, and all of his work. He asks really big questions. And you always go at those questions, I think, in provocative ways. And at the end of the day, the narrative is written beautifully. It is accessible. It is engaging. And it goes to prove that you can, in fact, write good history. That and anyone can do this. That you know, dives and seeks complexity. That challenges the reader, but doesn't lose them in jargon. And, uh, and so we'll get to talk more about this book. I was really impressed. And the day that I teach Southern history again, I think it's the day that I assigned this book because it is, I think, very good. But I'm going to go back, Ed, to get us started here to one of my other favorite books that you've done. It is a series of your essays. And uh, I thought the essay you did, what we talk about when we talk about the South. And uh, I want to just go from the first paragraph. I'm not going to read from it. I will summarize. In which you make the case that when Americans think about the South as a region, that you think that their thinking is somewhat muddled, uh, confused, uh, difficult for them to really get beyond one-dimensional characterizations and stereotypes. With that said, could you tell us a little bit about these struggles that Americans have in imagining the South? And then from that, I hope then you can lead into your new book. I talked yeah, to us about this book addresses that question, and then we can get into some of the nuts and bolts of, uh, of this volume. Great. Thank you so much, Pete, and I appreciate those, those generous words. Um, you know, the thing is, is that white Southerners and to some extent black Southerners are complicit in constructing this image of the South. Uh, it's a basically a place that is resistant to modern life in various kinds of ways and has been from its beginning is the story that we tell. And so you have, you know, we're talking about the Civil War today, the so-called industrial north against the so-called agrarian south. So we, we that's the thing that's taught all across the country, in my experience, that that's what kids think the Civil War is about. I point at agrarian sounds like Little House on the Prairie. These were giant agribusinesses based on enslaved labor. Okay? It's agrarian, doesn't really capture the spirit of that. And then we have movies like, you know, Gone with the Wind that romanticize uh, not only the relationships of slavery, but also the South's valiant struggle against the North and the Civil War and, and its humiliation and reconstruction. But then you have all the way up to the most recent movie, which I, I'm boycotting, Hillbilly Elegy, because it's really close to home, um, being hillbilly heritage myself, uh, in which in many ways the South is used to stand in for poverty uh, and for lack of change. Now, it's interesting. You can tell jokes about the white South that you can't tell about anybody else and jokes about you know trailer parks and things like that. They're supposedly funny. They're really jokes about poverty. So I, I've spent a lot of my, my career, including that promise of the New South book that, that, you, that you said nice things about, to show that the people of the South, of every class and race and gender, ethnicity, are fully human and living history in just as complex ways as other Americans. And so we kind of need the South to stay in place um, and, you know, you'll all the red states, the Bible Belt and all these kinds of things. But if you look closely and it's at the South, and that's what this project is really all about, is looking closely at the South in ways that include everybody. That's been the other thing about my work, I think, Pete, is I've tried to write, find ways of writing history that would include everybody within the same frame, rather than segregating out you know, black and white history or men's and women's history, or in my uh, two big books about the Civil War, military history and social history, try to show how they're, they're all connected. So that's the, the purpose behind all of this is to restore some of the fullness of the history of the South, which we all kind of conspire to diminish. I, I just want to quickly add and uh, reiterate, I think what's an excellent point, the ease in which we make light of impoverished white people, particularly in the South, and we do it in ways, think of all the jokes about West Virginians that are told with just impunity. I think of the show that I love, it's The Simpsons, but they have a stock character, his name's Cletus, right? And Cletus is the bumbling country fool. And so uh, a heightened awareness of the fact that we, um, it has a real political effect. I'm very much convinced of that. I have a 
outstanding student from Kentucky. He just graduated last year. He's from rural Kentucky. And he said to me, he said, the people who live around me believe that it's the East Coast liberals who have utter contempt for us, as does Hollywood. And I suspect he's onto something there. So yeah, again, that the scholarships that you're doing, that point that you're making, I think is so vital and so important. As we try to understand the Trump nation, which again, wants to be reduced to just racism and white nationalism. I think that your book and what you just said uh, tells that there's a, there's a much more complex story there. And so we'll get to that complex story and you can talk to us now, lead into the book, which has an exciting methodology and approach that one won't find in most, especially Southern history books, but history books in general. Yeah, I, I think uh, my friends Justin and Nathaniel basically invented this method. Um, and I saw it on another map that I, when I knew I was giving the, the Fleming lectures, I said, hey, that's cool. What would you think about making it for the entire South for 230 years? Actually for the entire nation. And, and lots of different maps that they, we've never made. And they said, sure, let's do that. So uh, I blame them for anything. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to focus on the war years uh, since that's the, the, the people who are tuning in may be especially interested in that. But I'll, I will start at the beginning. This is how the South actually is created. Of course, without the South, there is no civil war. Uh, all the maps uh, of this variety work the same. Uh, places that are varying shades of blue is where the population is declining of that ethnicity, right? And places where there are varying shades of brown is where it's rapidly growing. So this is showing the spread of slavery in the first decade for which we have the census data, uh, the first decade of the nation. As it turns out, the Ameri white Americans have been sort of obsessed with counting uh, racial difference from the very beginning. Uh, one of the few redeeming facts about that is we have data that lets us see this. So you'll also notice there's lots of little hexes, little uh, octagons there. Uh, that, those are hex bins, uh, and they are ways to avoid the main problem we have of all these new counties being created all the time. So if you're trying to show change over time, county boundaries are just a complete hassle. Plus, these are much smaller than counties, so it allows us to see change within. So what you're seeing here is that the oldest parts of Virginia where enslavement in the United States began uh, is already beginning to export enslaved people to the Piedmont, but also to the uh, South Carolina, Georgia upcountry, but also to the first New South. We're talking about Kentucky before. This is really where the, the South first expands. And one of the things that we do throughout is that we uh, compare the way that white and black population is changing. So we're gonna go pretty quickly, but what you'll see here is that white people do not move to the same places as black people are moved. So this is the next decade and look how much white people, they're leaving good old Virginia where I live and they're flooding to the bluegrass and they're flooding to the Nashville basin. They're also coming right up to the edge of where the American Indians live. And we'll see that in a little while, but they're also beginning to move to the outpost of Natchez and New Orleans. So keep that in mind and what you can actually see. Uh, so this is the digital version of the maps in our book. Uh, it doesn't have any of those awesome words that Pete was talking about. I'd have to say this is the hardest book I've ever written because how do you write a compelling paragraph about an image? Um, and the number of books I had to read to explain all of this was really hard. So this will show you, so there's white population change and there's black population change. And what you'll see here is it's what we see for the rest of the history of the slave South is that white people move to a much broader range of places, whereas black people are concentrated in places where slavery will pay. So we'll see this expanding. Now I want you to remember this is, this is gonna be significant. This is where, uh, we're going to see in a moment the dispossession of the native peoples uh, and uh, enslaved population being moved in. Same thing true with white people then. Okay, now watch this. This is, you see all the sessions of land. We often talk about Indian removal, but what this shows are, are several things. It'll, it'll run a few times. Is one, the South was basically occupied by indigenous people as late as 1814. Uh, and that Indian removal, as it was called, uh, was a process that was prolonged with millions of acres uh, taken from the indigenous people from uh, over all these years. So this allowed, takes advantage of some of the digital methods to actually 
let us see things that are harder to see. So this map is presented in the book and I explain it, uh, but it's, it's cool to be able to see, it's disheartening to see that. And look how much the South is occupied in 1814. You know, what one particular uh, phrase I hate is the old South. Right. Uh, it's what this shows at the time of the Civil War, much of Mississippi is about as old as subdivisions outside of town today. They're 30 years old. Right. Now we're starting to see the black population. Look how the depopulation of Virginia, South Carolina, and even of upcountry Georgia, they're just wearing the land out right. and moving enslaved people uh, to that. And you see now the Mississippi Delta for the first time really being settled. Uh, you see prices for enslaved people skyrocket. This is the Indian removal we talked about before. Yeah. You can see this, what this shows is go back. You can see where, where those areas are. Now let's look at where white people move in the next decade, yeah. right? They're filling, they're pushing the indigenous people out uh, as fast as they can. The growth of Louisiana sugar parishes along the rivers. Uh, and you see the white population is not moving to the black belt in the same way. That's something, something that those of us who talk about the Civil War always have to wrestle with is three-fourths of white some Southerners don't own slaves, right? Well, what they're showing is there's basically been white flight as long as there was a South. Right. Because if you're a poor family, you need to go where the land is relatively inexpensive. Right. And that's where, where it being taken from the indigenous people makes it inexpensive. Uh, but it also means that the rich people with uh, large enslaved populations are already monopolizing the best land. Look at this in, in, in 1840s, uh, but now we see the mature South. Look how far it's pushed across Louisiana and Tennessee, still the depopulation of Virginia. Here's another thing important for the Civil War. Virginia remains the state with the largest number of enslaved people all the way to 1860. Yeah. But over the course of this trade, a million Americans are bought and sold, a million and shift and you see where they're going. And they're going uh, to the Black Belt, okay? So th the comparison of this, what we see the railroads growing, the population density of the South remains much lower. You see immigrants don't really move to the South at all uh, before the Civil War. This is a very important map, I think. Areas that are green here are places where female enslaved people predominate and places that are orange and brown or places where males predominate. What you see is that the sugar districts buy 90% of their enslaved people are male. The women they buy are barely childbearing age and are expected to bear children for as long as they can. Um, and so this is separating out families. If you're a relatively, if you're a small slaveholders, the great majority of Southern white Southerners were, chances are you bought one person, you buy a woman who not only could was more versatile in the work she did, but also had children that then the slave owners claimed. This is puzzling. Uh, why should Virginia have a predominance of men? I think it's because women have been sold to all the rest of the South. Now to go to the, the subject of the American Civil War, let's look at this, okay? So this is the election of 1860. And areas that are brown are areas that vote for John C. Breckinridge uh, in the largest numbers in 1860. Now, we've had a hard time explaining the exact relationship of slavery and secession because there is no statistical correlation between slave owning and votes on secession. And that's puzzling to us because we know that slavery lies at the heart of the Civil War. Now, we can, this shows why. If you are an established slaveholder all the way down to Mississippi, you know the Constitution protects your enslaved property. You don't want to do the only thing that could possibly endanger that, which is to leave the United States and to leave the protection of the Constitution. On the other hand, if you're uh, poor white men who have moved into northern Alabama, much of Mississippi, much of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas, you think that I don't want to have the opportunity to become a slaveholder precluded. So what this shows, if we swap back over, you can see that white population change where it is growing most rapidly is where you are seeing uh, votes for secession. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So I will pause there, Pete, and see if you have any questions before I go into the, the war. Well, itself. We, I know Ashley has some questions, and we might get questions from the people watching as well. But we'll go ahead and turn it over to Ashley. Okay. Yeah. So Ed, you're you're touching on obviously one of the um, most important points. I think we can teach students about is the the connection between that small percentage of Southerners who own slaves and the vast majority of, of white Southerners who did not. Um, and one of the, the uh, lines in your book that I found the most provocative or, or perhaps the most um, uh, well summarizing of your larger points was, was the line um, that went something like uh, mobility unified the South across space. And so when we're talking about how these different people from disparate economic backgrounds, social backgrounds, political backgrounds, um, they find commonality in the ability to move, in the right to move, um, that you're you're getting at an important point there that that helps to form some kind of unification um, that, that forms the backbone of, of the Confederacy. Can you kind of unpack that a little bit more about how exactly mobility unified the South across space? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'd say a couple of things. One, uh, the South is basically self-populating. Uh, there are very few people coming from outside the South to uh, to settle it. So if you're if you look at uh, Texas or Louisiana uh, or Mississippi, they're basically settled by people who are moving from the eastern part of the South, right? And so the, what you have is a replication of the eastern South, um, and you also have you know the direct family connections. Uh, so that these are people who are riding back from Mississippi to South Carolina. Hey, you ought to come out here. You know, the land is so rich and deep, it's not worn out like it is back home. Uh, but you also have the economic interest of the enslaved population of the Eastern South it can be sold to the uh, Western South. So you have economic self-interest, which I think we focused on more perhaps as we think about what unified the Confederacy. The Upper South needs the Lower South as a, a market uh, for what they would call their surplus enslaved population. But it's also the case that the South really is the same place replicated over and over again. You know, I showed the population density map briefly, and it's a fact that Southerners, whether they own slaves or not, tried to create larger farms and, and occupy them less densely. That's partly because of the, the crops they could grow, but it's also because just a preference, sort of a cultural preference for uh, living in decentralized places. So, you know, again, as I was saying, Mississippi is basically new in 1860 and Texas even more so, um, but they are tied by kinship uh, to all the people in the rest of the South. Sure. sure. Yeah, thanks a lot. So Ed, this emphasis on mobility uh, and the expansiveness of the slave South, I'd like for you to engage a recent historiographical trend. And I know Ed is thinking, God, Pete, you just said we do public history here. And I just uttered the word historiography, which, as I've said before, is like ether coming out of my mouth in my classroom. I, always, I can't bring it back in, right? I'm sorry, like, what are you saying? I went to sleep now. Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, this recent debate, I'll, I'll take away historiography, among historians in which there's a, Pierce, a, a trend line favoring a description of the South as being capitalistic and that slavery is capitalistic. So could you do two things for us, please? Could you first sorry, give us a, a sense of what is this debate about? It's not anything new, I should note. I just want to make that point. I mean, a lot of people are talking about the South and slavery as a capitalist system as if we've never debated that before, we have. So could you talk a little bit about that debate and then tell us how your research in this book, how it figures into that conversation? Yeah, well, there's several things that we mean by capitalist. Do we mean profit oriented? Heck yeah, <laughs> uh, for especially I'm showing the map of cotton production now in 1860. Uh, this is much expanded by 1900. One thing people don't know, the South grows a lot more cotton in 1900 than it does in 1860. But you can see how finely attuned to the market slavery is. That people, you, you saw the slave prices that I was showing before, right? They are uh, finely uh, calibrated uh, to, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, it's farther than I realized. Uh, uh, 
finally calibrated to the swings of the international market. So that, and you can see too, something that people often struggle with at the Civil War is slavery declining. Well, not in any economic sense. Slave, in slave prices have never been higher. The pr price of cotton has never been higher. The ratio of cotton as America's total exports have never been higher. The enslaved population of the South is worth more than all the railroads and banks and factories of the North combined, right? So in all those ways, it is uh, capitalistic. I'm not really sure what we gain from using that word other than to solely capitalism, <laughs> you know? Um, but it is certainly the case, and that's part of my beef against agrarian, as if they are just, you know, uh, out in the country, not really attuned to markets. Uh, what you're seeing, this kind of goes back to Ashley's question, the people, why are Southerners moving? Let's just imagine today, if the government said, hey, there is land that you can have for a dollar and a quarter an acre or whatever the equivalent of that today would be $20 an acre if you'll just move to it and sell, right? So is that capitalist to move to it? Or is it trying to establish a, an, a, an outpost for your family that you could not possibly have if you stayed in North Carolina or Virginia? So people are very finely attuned to the swings of the national and international market and cotton prices and prices for enslaved people. But on the other hand, a lot of the people who are moving to these frontiers do not have the wherewithal, not being slaveholders, to participate in the capitalist economy in anything other than a marginal sense. So Pete, I come down strongly on both sides of that, of that debate. Um, but I think what we, we have set aside is this idea that the South as a whole, whether the slaveholding component or the yeoman component were not attuned to the market is mythology, right? Uh, Absolutely. I know Ashley has read some things on this. I'm curious about her opinion. Uh, okay. Ashley, uh, some time ago, uh, she was in one of my graduate seminars, and I always have my students read Genovese, who's fallen completely out of fashion. And I think it's in part that this juggernaut of those who are advocating that slavery is capitalistic. And I think you've made some excellent observations in which you recognize the virtues of that approach in that school. But at the end of the day, it's really not revealing a great deal that we probably don't already know. But actually, I'm just curious, in, you know, in reading Ed's book and the things that you've thought about as well, you know, how do we think about the nature of Southern society and this emphasis on the capitalistic elements of slavery? You know, what has it revealed to us? So I'm curious, Ashley's thoughts um, about this debate and about how Ed's book fits into it. Yeah, I mean, so, everyone questions here, Ed. I'm just anyone. Someone walks into the room behind you, I'll ask them a question as well. I'm it's very interesting. I, I'm happy to talk about this. I've tried to pull up a map that maybe less is addressed right here. Ashley's question. Um, so one of the the things that I guess that I've gotten the most out of that debate um, between the capitalist North and the supposedly non-capitalist South were um, was the the different forms that so-called capitalism can take and the different interpretations of it. Um, that people can have. And I think, you know, going back to my, my park service days and, and working in Richmond, for instance, and working at the Tredegar Ironworks and people would come in, um, you know, and, and they would say to my face, you know, slavery was dying out by, by the time of the war. Um, you know, there was no reason for the North to, you know, precipitate this, this fight, et cetera, et cetera, in the building where industrial slavery was taking off, you know, by leaps and bounds. Um, and so for me, that was, that was an opportunity to kind of explain the so-called capitalistic um, ideas behind uh, Southern slavery and the way that it was you know, modernizing or had already modernized to a point to compete, you know, with with northern industrial interests. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's a little bit of a, a stale debate as well, um, just because I, I, I think it draws these kind of black and white lines between north and south, which, which are arbitrary um, and which, again, obscure kind of the ways that the south was much more involved with capitalism, not only in, in a region, but also between regions. And, you know, one of the things that your book does nicely is talk about how these migrations are occurring not only 
across the South, and there are all these massive changes in, occurring within the region itself, but also migrations in and out of the South, and also people coming from abroad um, and, and changing up uh, the population of the South, which I um, hoped that you could speak on um, maybe at a, at a later time after we move through the capitalism debate. Um, but I, you know, that's one of the things that I think I, I took away from your book was kind of that, that reinforcing of that idea um, that these these strict binaries uh, of north south capitalism anti capitalism they're much more blurry um, and large part because of all of this mobility that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I think to go back to a point that Pete made about my little book, what caused the Civil War, I point out that that the South was modern in all the ways that allowed it to create a nation state out of nothing and fight a war against the United States for four years. So it's modern in terms of adoption of print. Of, its, uh, of the government for white people, of uh, the way that its politics is, is democratic, um, of the way that it is, in fact, wealthy and can buy much of what it needs. So capitalist and anti-capitalist obscures another division between sort of nation state and uh, sort of region. And so I think, you know, it's amazing to me how quickly the South was able to mobilize. And there, Tredegar, I'm going to use this opportunity to say, to everyone listening, if you've not been to the New American Civil War Museum in Richmond at Tredegar, it's the best museum of the Civil War anywhere. And it's uh, we just opened last year. Uh, it's going to be great. So you need to come see it. I chaired the board of that for eight years. Uh, it merged the Museum of the Confederacy with the American Civil War Center. So it's a, a very powerful story. Now, back to our show. Pete, yeah. I think, all right. You know, I'm, I know Ashley's been. I've not been to the museum yet, and uh, I will once this pandemic passes. And yeah. Your summer, I'll definitely get down there. And as, Ed, as you know, we have a fantastic public history program here, a minor, in fact. And so I am eager to get some of our students to intern down there. We we place oh, new students every summer, so we'd like to send some down. Oh, that'd be great. Um, yeah. Another, we do lots of show and tell here, Ed. Uh, slavery's capitalism, this is, again, a, I think a fantastic uh, collection of essays that engage this debate and from the uh, title of the book, you can imagine what the disposition is of the various authors, even though I'm certainly at odds with much of this, I still think it's a really important book uh, to read. And before we go on, I just, I, I have to say this. Um, yeah, I, I think with uh, pretty, pretty strongly, and that is, Ed, your use of an expansive slave society. And I felt like when I read that, I thought, oh, that's it. Finally, we have it. We we have now the characterization that is capacious enough to include the capitalistic elements that we always knew existed in the South. And yet at the same time, it captures how dynamic this system was and still allows for the differences within the South. This expansive capitalistic, or excuse me, expansive slave society, that's it. I, I've been using progressive slave society, and that's the language that a lot of 19th century Southerners use, but that doesn't quite do it, right? But that language does. And I, again, I was, as you can tell, really excited when I read this, the maps and your text, and I thought, you know what? We finally have, I think, some resolution in the historiography. We know that that will be a jumping off point for new arguments and new debates, but that's a, that's a massive contribution, I think, of this book. Thanks. Now, yeah, really important. Uh, you like to talk about the Civil War? Yeah, we will do a little bit of that here. Ashley, do you have a Civil War question? Well, I, I need to show you some oh, stuff. Show us something. Okay, please do. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is uh, the areas that are red are where uh, African American people come into contact with the United States Army, um, and so the heat map. So that's pretty amazing uh, just to see, uh, you know. Uh, and, you know, those of us who know the Civil War, oh, yeah, of course, they blockade the South Carolina coast. And of course, Virginia is consumed by the war and the Mississippi River. Uh, but and keep this map in mind because we're going to see some uh, other consequences of it. So uh, Chandra Manning allowed us to uh, build on her maps to sort of show people uh, where all the refugee camps are. Uh, my stu student, uh, Amy Taylor, incredibly great book about the, the refugee camps. And so we're talking about mobility. I write about the refugees of both white and black because they end up having a big consequence. So this is the decade of the civil war, obviously. What do we see is that look at how white people are leaving the entire slave South and moving to the upper South. 
if we could see the rest of the country as we will in later maps, we would see many people are leaving. You know, Ashley talked before about people leaving not to the South for other places. More white Virginians leave for the upper Midwest than leave for the South. Hmm. Okay, so that's an interesting thing to think about. Does that, is that a kind of vote with your feet against slavery? Uh, or is it just that it's closer and easier? And it's, it's interesting to think about. But, but look at the, here's the surprising fact. Black population changed. Now, one of the things you should see is that all the areas where the United States Army had been, black people are, have left every single place, right? We know that's partly because of the dislocation. It's also just the opportunity to get the heck out of Dodge. Here in Virginia, people go to Fort Monroe within the three days, three weeks after the secession of Virginia, and they continue to go there. But through much of the rest of the South, people are leaving. Where are they going? They're going to the Black Belt. Why would you do that if you're just coming out of slavery? Well, if you're in sharecropping and you have to share the crop, you'd like to share the crop that's worth the most. So we're going to see this pattern continue very much. It's so hard for me to skip over all these things. But since we talked about capitalism, we'll just show this. So that's in 1910. Look, look how the area devoted to cotton expands between 1860 and 1910. Okay. 1840, 1850 map up. Yeah. Is that what you're seeing now? That's what I'm seeing. You're not seeing all the things I'm talking about? We Well, I was seeing stuff move. But when yeah, now we, we kind of froze on this one. Yeah, to see if you can change it again. Okay, I'm going to come back to it. How about that? Um, you see white population change 1890, 1900? Yeah. No. No? Um, bowl weevil. So let me go back to this then. I can do this. Excuse me while I yeah. screen by, get to the bottom. See if this takes me there. You see Restless South, 1860, 1940? No, we're still at the bottom. Yeah, you see chapter two, the Restless South. Huh. What are you trying to find? Wait, why population change? 18 no, I'm trying to show you. How about that? Do you see it now? No. Emancipation? No. <laughs> well, um, well, I'm just going to talk through. I don't know. See if I can show. If the, does that say three? Do you see that? Let me close the first one. Okay. Now, do you, what do you see? Just us. Just see your face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. It doesn't say share screen anymore. That went off. So. Uh, do you want to try to share it again? Yeah, I do. Hello. I see you now. <laughs> And I can also, if you want, I can show something from the book. If that's yeah, that would be fun. What page? Is, what page would you like me to? At, at the beginning of chapter two. Um, we were having fun, weren't we? I love that how they move. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's this I should know what a lovely thing you did, Ed, in this book, and uh, dedicating it to your graduate students. So for those who are not familiar with Ed's work. Uh, and what he's done in the field. Ed, God, how many graduate students did you direct their dissertation? Certainly more than 30, I would think. Yeah, 42. Yeah, 42, 42. And they have populated the field and doing incredible work. Amy Taylor is one of the people that you mentioned. She's an outstanding yeah. scholar at Kentucky. And Are you seeing anything different now? Ed, no, we're seeing I mean, just the, the title of your, of your uh are We're there? seeing three, Arrival and Return, 1940 to 2020. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. Well, if that's what you're seeing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. We'll just go ahead and go to that, okay? Because okay. It, yeah. that's interesting to people because it's the current day. Right. Okay? I'll take that to be destiny. So, Pete, you were showing, you know, what I show is that uh, the patterns of black migration after the Civil War continue those of before the Civil War because black people have nowhere else to go. They are not welcome in the North um, and the best, the best paying jobs are in the South uh, for black people. So that's what that's showing. It also shows that during all this time, white people leave the South by the many millions. Okay? But now I wanna, uh, and I also show, that, so this is the latter stages of the great migration. You guys will recognize that this is like a reverse image, right? Of what we saw 
of the forced migration of slavery, right? right? So you're seeing how bright blue the Mississippi Delta is and the Black Belt, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and, but you also see black people moving to the cities, right? See Atlanta and Birmingham and Memphis. But what you'll also see is by this time, look how the cities of the North right. are, are growing. Yeah. I just wrote a, a, a long Twitter stream. And also uh, this is um, part of newamericanhistory.org, which is the big site that I'm, that's what I'm leading now, which is creating new forms of history to bridge um, public and school history. But to show you this, look at this, the black, the great migration continues into the 1950s and you still see the same patterns. And what I argued uh, in my most recent essay on New American history is that the pattern of the election of 2020 is best explained by the migration of 1820s of, of slavery and then of the 1920s of the great migration. So if you think about where... Who made Joe Biden the Democratic nominee? The black voters of South Carolina, right? So I think people don't really, you know, we're slicing and dicing every suburban area trying to figure out these small differences. The fundamental patterns of American political life are defined by the migration of black Southerners. Now, here's something to, and you see in the 1960s this continued, but look here, 1970s, it begins to reverse. Right. And for the first time in American history, black Southerners are moving, black people are moving to the South. Right. And matter of fact, the South is the major destination of black people moving in the United States. So for somebody who lived through all the suffering of the South right. to see that people are choosing to move here now um, gives me hope. Now, what you see here, these are my people. This is Appalachia. Right. The decade in which I was born, my, my folks moved right just across that line um, in, from North Carolina to Tennessee. But look how the Black Belt and Appalachia are just being decimated. Continues into the 60s. But there, too, in the 1970s, people are moving to the South. We all know about Florida booming. We know about Texas booming. But also the whole Piedmont, the Upland South. Uh, is a, a place where many Americans want to live now. This is kind of cool. And, and I don't want to be uh, to be difficult, but I will just a little bit. What you've just described in the maps would, I think, in a way, undercut the argument that national politics that it has, in, in large part, hinged upon these movements of African Americans. Couldn't one also make the argument that what your maps really reveal to us? is the limitations of characterizing politics along identity or racial lines because those white folks from your neighborhood who then ventured up north, they're the very same white folks who in one election vote for Obama, then the other election they vote for Trump. My point being is, is that the movements of these groups in themselves is fascinating and important, but to single out any one group seems to undermine and undercut the whole that you're actually trying to recreate for us. That's really eloquently put, and therefore I resent it. But <laughs> I disagree with that. It's really only, so those same white voters, I come from the only congressional district in the South that's voted Republican since 1865. Mm -hmm. I went to Andrew Johnson Elementary School, <laughs> and it was Republican all that time. Today, it's you know three-fourths Trump, right. right? And so with no tradition, no connection to the Confederacy at all. Right. Those white Southerners, and we're, I'm going to show you here very quickly, Latinx and Asian Americans who, who are moving to the South in large numbers. You're exactly right. If we want to use the larger concept of identity politics, Pete, but for black Americans, where black, well, I will show you, when you look at the map, Democrats are where black people are. Right. They're the most loyal members of the party that finally destroyed segregation and that created the Voting Rights Act. And so, Black Southerners, Black Americans are an exception to your general position, which I would generally endorse. Right. Can we get that as a... Sure. <laughs> but, so, so here's the other thing that people, again, to go back, we saw the map before about how few immigrants moved to the South. Yeah. Look at this. That, that's 18, 1990s. That's unbelievable. But, and you can see the South is getting more than its share of people from Latin America. We know that they're moving to Florida and Texas. But look all to the interior south and look at all the suburbs. Go back to the elections, Pete. We were talking about the suburbs. Yeah. 
And we saw how people from Cuba are voting differently than the people from Mexico, uh, that people from you know, Guatemala, whatever, are moving, voting quite differently elsewhere. Right. Quite different for Asian Americans who are heavily urban. Look at that, there's almost no chain, but you can see the enormous numbers of Asian Americans who live in the suburbs of the South. Yeah. So what we're seeing now is that the rural South, and this goes again to the politics, white people fleeing, not only Appalachia still, but areas that are heavily black. Right. They're moving to I-85 <laughs> in Florida and Texas. Yeah. Yeah. This does this. Which, which, as you've already said, uh, inconceivable. To yeah. 15 years ago, it, you know, inconceivable. This, I, we'd lost a lot of money. Betty, yeah. the demographics would have changed the way that they have. Just well, what you see here, too, is that you see how much the South is attracting people, but you can also see the enduring power of the slave population. That's right. And it's, cracker barrel. It's, it's Cracker Barrel in the South. That's what's drawing people down there. You it is. The cracker Barrel, that is the best chain around. Ashley and I do agree upon that. I really well, love Cracker Barrel. I think that's it. Well, I don't know if you saw before, but I have animated maps of the spread of the interstate highway system, which goes the closest to explaining uh, where the geography today is that basically if you don't have an interstate highway exit and you're a rural area, you're in serious trouble. In so this trouble. is what I was talking before about, Pete. Look at this. See how this is exactly the pattern of the Black Belt and then the result of the Great Migration? So that's what I was talking about. Yeah. But look at this, too. Patterns of poor health. Yeah. The, the whitest areas of the South and the blackest areas. And if we look at family income below poverty, the same thing. And so as a result, when the COVID crisis came, look at the overlay over the black population that was first created. You saw in our first maps of 1820, right. the enduring power of history. And then this was from the summer. You were talking before about how great LSU was. They let us get a map in this summer of the most recent. Right. And so now if you still do per capita, yeah. You'll still see this pattern, uh, even though now it's spreading in the rest of the country. The South has this. So what can, you, can we go back to this map, though? And again, I want to press a little bit. Is which one? You just sort of take your analysis to its outcome. And are you uh, then suggesting that the density of the COVID cases that you see as in part a legacy or residue of enslavement? But you're also, I think, making the argument that it's very much rooted within this place that is an impoverished place for black and white people is that correct and it's not only impoverished it's depleted population so back to my theme of movement yes uh, yeah. sort of the, the line that i kind of like in my book which is very few yeah. looking back on it you know what that's like <laughs> but one of my like is that mobility migration is the very pulse of southern history yeah. Yeah. that you can see what is happening in the south by where people choose to move now Here's the thing, most people in the South, male and female, black or white, immigrant or native, left no record in the, hum in the, in the historical record. Sure. But we know where they were and that we know what decisions they made or what decisions were made for them by their movement, sure. right? So what you're seeing both in Appalachia, which of course is now infected with COVID and in the Black Belt, is out migration. Mm -hmm. So these are places, and that's the main problem of Appalachia. People like me, you know, leave. Uh, and what it means is that the population there is now increasingly elderly, increasingly a, a small tax basis, um, that the, the schools are struggling. Um, and what another thing we could say is that why this is also state policy. Um, you know, that the South has chosen not to invest in public health um, and in hospitals. Um, and so that's why you could go back and see this pattern of, of poor, poor health long predates COVID. And you can see here the difference, Virginia, which has a relatively advanced system of public health compared to Kentucky or West Virginia or, or my native or Tennessee, right? So that public, I, I do believe that our ideology of is also a product of this mobility. Basically, the idea is that people should be free to determine their own 
future uh, by settling and having as few constraints on them by the government as possible. There was recently a big protest in a county in Virginia, around here, resisting, de declaring themselves nullifying the COVID restrictions from the governor. And they said, it's our freedom. And 300 people get together in the basement room, take off their masks to demonstrate their freedom. I think that's a direct uh, descendant of the ideology of being able to expand and basically be free of any kind of constraint. And, and, and again, I, I think this is what's so wonderful about the, the maps. That what you have done for us is you've made that vital connection between ideology and between the material world that people inhabit. That nexus is critical. We lose it. I think we've lost it. Ashley and I talk about this a good bit in terms of history, the use of identity and the overuse of it, that it often, as historians use it, it exists in a very detached way from the day-to-day yeah. -day realities of people. And I mean, that's what's so, I think, important about this book is that you have made that connection for us. I hope it sticks with people because the things that you have just said about the impoverished rural South I mean, all I have to do is walk outside my house here and I can see uh, Appalachia, Central PA, and they're dealing with those very same issues. And I am, to sort of bring us back to your point, the dismissiveness and the downright cruelty in which people speak of poor whites, particularly in rural areas. I hope that, that academics and the progressive left will start to see that, you know, if we continue to overlook and forget people of that background, they will turn, as we've seen, to politics that are disconcerting. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat, but I do get a little concerned when they embrace politics of violence. And, and we're starting to see at least that that is attractive to some. So again, I think this book is, is so important. I want to throw it back to Ashley before we close here, as I know Ashley had some other questions about the yeah. Civil War. And so we'll wrap it up with the Civil War question here uh, and we'll let uh, Ashley fire away. If I could actually, before that, um, ask a question that came in from um, one of our viewers about the source material, Ed, that you're using. Obviously, the census records are, are huge, but as you mentioned, they're often incomplete or they don't tell the full story. So what other sources are you mining and, and putting together to create this? Well, all of these maps are the census, but what we've done is transform them to overcome some of the limitations of uh, couple of things. One, by getting rid of county boundaries. Now we talked today about the red and blue, right? Huge parts of America looks red, but that's of acreage, not of people, right? Our maps are overcoming that and showing people only. The other thing that they're doing is that these uh, hexes, hex bins, are a direct reflection of the number of people. So it's not a rate of growth it's actually where people are moving to. So it was a good question. My answer is it's basically the census data, which has always been there, but we're bringing, and you go to Pete's point, a grid of time and space that helps us make sense of other kinds of things like identity, right? You can understand that people are moving where they are. And when they do move, it changes the situations in which they live. So. All these other maps uh, are, you know, this is also census data. Uh, and so that's a fascinating one. But a lot of these others that are in earlier chapters, uh, we are made from uh, visual images uh, that uh, we have transformed uh, in, into another form. So, but the great majority of this is taking something that's been lying right on the surface of census data and showing that it has means that we can see in new ways if we use uh, methods that are fundamentally historical. You know, uh, it has to be decade by decade. I have to explain what's happening in every single decade because these trends over, if you said, let's look at why population change between 1960 and the present. Well, the first two decades, it's rat radically declining and then picks up. So I, I find a, a kind of a sweeping generalizations don't do justice to any of this. So I'm sorry, it was kind of a long answer, but I hope it answered our friend's question. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, you also made a point, a good point in your book about how with indigenous peoples, for instance, I mean, there's a change in how people are logging their identities now, um, or, you know, in the recent, more recent past for native people than they were before, um, where all of a sudden, you know, smaller percentages of, of blood are being logged or, you know, identity is being expanded. Um, so it makes it seem like if you're looking at a map from, you know, 1920 versus 1980 in the same place, you know, very well, the population could have remained the same, but all of a sudden more people are identifying as native, um, which can also skew things and make people think, oh, well, more people, you know, moved to that that particular area who were native, when in fact, it's the same people, they're just identifying in an expanded way. Yeah, and that's, you know, all these maps have all kinds of complexities I don't always call attention to, but this is one of it, right? Just exactly what you're saying, Ashley, because I gave a talk with a lot of uh, native leaders and I was describing what I was going to say to a friend of mine who works very close with them. He says, Ed, you can't, you have to acknowledge that these are people who are just claiming to be part Seminole or Cherokee because the Cherokee themselves are working really hard to maintain tribal integrity, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but I, I find this very interesting to, especially after Indian dispossession, Look where the Seminoles still live in Florida. Look where the Lumbee people still live North in North Carolina. Look where the Creek live now. So I find this heartening in some ways. It goes back to Pete's question about identity. Now, for the first time, people who are identified as white or black are able to identify who they are and to increase numbers are identifying as Native American. Um, and in the exact same places where they were driven from. So I think that's another interesting issue of, uh, you know, we can't take any of these things for granted, but we have to take them all seriously. Do, do you have a dot on uh, Boston, Massachusetts for Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad joke. That it was. was. I'm waiting for Ashley to ask a better. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's get a civil war, civil war question here. Or anything else. I'm happy to talk about anything. <laughs> Go ahead, Ashley. So uh, another question I had for you, I mean, obviously, when we're talking about the, the African-American population before the war and during the war, um, you see movement of, of black people, but that movement is not just slaves. There's also a free black population that you're talking about as well. So what are the, the complexities in terms of um, allowing the maps to tell that story in a more nuanced way? Yeah, that's good. I had to go back and do other research because the census data itself doesn't really identify that. So I, tr I had to figure out how many uh, people of African-American ancestry sort of left the South before the Civil War. And I think the number is 80 or 90,000, perhaps. Then I had to figure out uh, how many black people left the South before 1910. Uh, and that's also not clear because the numbers are not large and they, they wouldn't show up very much on these maps, uh, but it's probably one or 200,000, right? So from one perspective, out of 4 million, that's not many, 100,000 families is a lot, right? So a lot of times, I think this is an important thing to understand, that these maps are puzzles, not solutions. They do not explain themselves, which is why I went to all the trouble of writing those words to explain what they actually mean. And so you have to rub against the grain of the maps. But until you see the maps, you don't know what you're rubbing against. Now, I, I describe them as a, like an MRI. Uh, you know, those who have a broken bone or something, you know, or you, when they show a, a, your brain, places where the blood's rushing is where activity is taking place. This allows us to see where the blood's going and, and where it's going coming from. Uh, but it doesn't explain anything. You have to be a doctor to know what an fMRI says. You kind of have to be a historian to be able to explain what these maps mean. Yeah. That is a perfect way, I think, of concluding our conversation. I will note that the footnotes uh, for Ed's book are rich with the very sources that are so indispensable to reading on a map. Here is the book again. You know, Ed, I think that I've held this up so often that I am probably qualified to be one of those people who's dressed up as a Statue of Liberty outside, you know. You a around yeah, 
I'll do that for you, man. I'll do your book. All I ask for is I would like to wear the National Humanities Medal while I'm doing it. I think that's a, we'll break the glass. Right. Break the glass. I think it'll be well worth it. I want to also say that um, Ed has always been so generous to me in my career. He nicely blurred my, my second book. And I know so many of his graduate students and all of them speak so highly of him, not just because he's a great scholar, but because he's a person who really cares. He cares about his students. He cares about the public. He does everything that people say academics don't do. Right. He is a person who reaches out and uh, you have you have worked on so many different levels. You've made such a profound difference. And, and not that I was skeptical of this book, but in all seriousness, I thought, seriously, what, what more can he say? What more can he do? This is such an important book. I enjoyed it so much. And uh, like I said, we Ashley and I are so grateful that you came on the show. And of course, we're going to have to bring you back to CWI to speak and to talk some more about this. So Ed, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's great talking with both of you. I really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing both of you in Richmond, okay? Absolutely, I'll be at the museum. Okay, thank you, everybody. All right, bye -bye. take good care. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, so